Hi guys, uh, good afternoon. Uh, give me a quick confirmation if I am visible and audible to you all. <laughs> yeah, uh, so we are on to part four of uh, this series on the top 100 images that we shall be discussing from radiology. And we are also doing them uh, in detail so that you know those topics get covered which are uh, highly expected in the examination. Um, so that is the plan. Uh, so um, just waiting on the confirmation if I'm visible and audible. So my name is Zainab and I've uh, done my MBBS and MD in radiology from Ames New Delhi. And today uh, we are discussing this. So this is the schedule. So till Sunday, we, we're going to be continuing with the series and be done with it hopefully by Sunday. Uh, so every day, four o'clock, uh, yeah, we'll be doing and continuing with this. Apart from that, tonight and tomorrow night for the plus subscribers on an academy, we have the integrated session on medicine and radiology with Dr. Santosh. Uh, today we shall be discussing an approach to stroke, right? Uh, the management aspect, the imaging aspect, everything, because you do get a lot of questions from here. And tomorrow we'll be discussing pancreatitis, pneumothorax, and a few other emergencies, okay? So we are uh, basically going to be uh, doing important topics. This is live satirik, all right? Every day it's a live class which we are having. Uh, after that, uh, we shall be continuing with MKT in the next week, all right? Uh, so this is about the schedule. Apart from that, 5th of September, Teacher's Day, an academy celebrating uh, an academy one, wherein they are going to be uh, um, telling you about a lot of other new offers and, uh, you know, updates about the app. So uh, stay tuned and, you know, you can log into the live event at 6 o'clock uh, celebrating Teacher's Day. So uh, make sure you check it out. And this is the batch which is started on 25th of August. Yeah, so integrated and system-wise batch and QBank 2.0 is also something which uh, an academy is launching very soon. All right, so this is about the updates as far as an academy goes. Now we continue with the images, right? So we had uh, done 42 images and now we are on the 43rd. More, madam, MKT is more 2.0 in a way, right? So we're doing it in one of like similar format. We are not doing a lot of topics, but we are doing important topics in detail. Yeah, so that is what we are uh, doing. Okay. Why is this? What is happening? What do I do with this finger? Okay, just hold on. Let me see. Just give me a minute, yeah. Oh, right. Hi guys, am I back? Uh, can you all see me and hear me? No, glass is not over. I was uh, as Pulkit uh, correctly guessed it as figuring out notability and why it is not working. Uh, am I back? Yeah, so I did solve it uh, successfully for a change. Uh, so yeah, le let's uh, begin then. Yeah, uh, so we are on the 43rd image, uh, which is about active tuberculosis. All right. So this is uh, what uh, is very important to you for you to know, you know, in our setup, no matter which uh, residency you take, you'll encounter some case of TB, you know, in your life for sure. So uh, how uh, active tuberculosis will present is there are two main kind of, uh, you know, manifestations that you need to know. So here, uh, the first HRCT, so this is a high resolution CT and what you can see here is that along the bronchus you are having this sort of a nodular pattern which looks like what? It looks like a branching bud. Yeah, so this is called as the tree in bud sign yeah so this is called as pre in bud appearance and apart from that the other sign that we are indeed dealing with a case of active tuberculosis would be the presence of these necrotic lymph nodes can you all see here so this is a mediastinal section of the ct scan these are the vessels yeah so this is superior vena cava this is ascending iota this is a part of the pulmonary artery and this is descending iota here you can also see how the trachea is bifurcated yeah so these lymph nodes here we have right and left and you can also see that here because this is the bifurcation this is the carina so these are the subcarinal lymph nodes so all of these are mediastinal lymph nodes and do you see how they have this peripheral white rim and center is very gray yeah so this indicates that they are necrotic so we call them rim enhancing lymph nodes yeah so rim enhancing or necrotic lymph nodes and apart from that the other feature is do you see how they are all merging conglomerating into one another 
Yeah. So conglomeration is again something which is a big manifestation of tuberculosis. All right. So remember, anywhere you go, conglomerating lesions, necrotic lesions, rim enhancing lesions is something which you will see. See, esophagus is a very collapsible tube, you know. So, amidst all of these enlarged lymph nodes, it must be compressed somewhere, right? So, it's a collapsible structure. Only when it's distended do you see the esophagus. Normally, without lymph nodes also, we don't really see the esophagus as a very distended structure, you know, normally. That's why, okay? So, these are the two manifestations of TB that you need to remember. One is going to be necrotic lymph nodes, mediastinal lymph nodes. Second is tree in bud. Alright, so both of these findings are going to be findings of active tuberculosis in the lungs. Remember, tree in bud basically indicates that the infection is spreading via an endobronchial root. Yeah, so it is spreading via the bronchus. So this is called as an endobronchial spread of tuberculosis. And also remember one more thing that this pattern is also called as a centrilobular pattern. Yeah, so these are called as centrilobular nodules. Whenever you hear any of these words, the examiner is giving you a hint and he's talking about active tuberculosis, okay? So, this is tree in bud, necrotic lymph nodes, active. Just to give you a side note, what do you see as sequelae of TB? Anytime it is not active TB, but what are the changes that tuberculosis will leave as a scar in patients? So, first, you can see a lot of cavitation, yeah? There can be cavities, there can be fibrotic changes, fibrosis. And you might also see bronchiectasis. Yeah, so these are all changes which do not indicate active tuberculosis, but a sequelae that TB was there. Now it is not there. It is a sequelae, right? Or a chronic tuberculosis. Basically, both of them will have these findings like cavitation, fibrosis, bronchiectasis. Okay, so understanding difference between active and sequelae is very important. Apart from that, if you remember in the previous images, we already have seen miliary TB, which indicates a hematogenous spread, right? Okay. What about this skull? Again, something which figures very frequently in FMG exams. One skull X-ray always comes in uh, you know, every exam. So here you can see that there are these well-defined black lytic lesions, isn't it? It looks like there are these punches that we have drawn inside the skull. So this is called as a punched out skull or is also called as a raindrop appearance. Okay. So this is indicated in, yes, this is seen in multiple myeloma. Right, so this is seen in multiple myeloma predominantly. The other differential, anybody can tell me one more differential that you always have to consider when there are multifocal lytic lesions is going to be metastasis, right? So 2DD is lytic metastasis and multiple myeloma. So now depending on the appearance, remember, uh, uh, de depending on the history, we are going to be have to, we're going to have to uh, distinguish these two. Multiple myeloma, as you know, you would have associated crab features. Yeah, so you can have hypercalcemia, renal failure, anemia, and these bony lesions. So the crab features will be positive in multiple myeloma. Lytic metastasis, obviously, you'll have a history of some sort of a primary malignancy. Now, you guys giving me other differentials. So remember, when we talk about hyperparathyroidism, yeah, so you're going to be seeing very, very tiny, tiny lytic lesion, which is called as a salt and pepper skull. It won't be as big as this. On the other hand, the next differential that you guys give me, LCH. LCH will be one, a child. Second, you will have a very large geographical lesion with a beveled margin. So, you're going to be seeing these two types of lesions. So, here it's going to be a child with a large geographical lesion with two margins, all right? So, that is how LCH will appear, not like this, okay? So, this is the difference from very small HPT to middle-sized, which is punched out or raindrop, to very big, which is LCH. Yeah? So, that's the continuum you need to have in mind when you're dealing with lytic lesions of the skull. Is that clear? Everybody, take care. Now, this is something which is a very cliched question. I'm sure all of you guys can see that there is a thumb which is projecting into the trachea, into the airway. Yeah. So, what is this? This is the thumb sign which represents inflammation of the epiglottis, which is acute epiglottitis right so this is basically acute epiglottitis the causative organism is bacterial right so the causative organism here is going to be bacterial wherein the most common causes strep followed by hemophilus influenza b earlier this was the most common cause but now because of it being vaccine preventable this is no longer the most common cause and this was repeat fmg question where they had asked you what is the most common cause of acute epiglottitis and it is streptococcus right so remember this. 
okay yeah so this is about thumb sign or acute epiglottitis fine it is having a lot of background noise okay so this is about that um, apart uh, apart from this acute epiglottitis remember you will get a very very sick child a very toxic looking child um, and uh, the child would have fever the child would have dyspnea hot potato voice dysphagia you know so very very uh, severe features you would be getting and also you want to remember that the child would be sitting in a typical a uh, tripod position yeah so tripod position dyspnea fever hot potato voice all of these are your uh, differentials that you want to consider and if they ask you the next step here always remember that if the child is so sick he cannot breathe you don't really want to send for x ray to see thumb sign you don't want to start antibiotics first but first you want to secure the airway right so always remember that the next step here is going to be a uh, intubation right so this is about that okay so right what about this as you guys already picked it up this is indeed steeple right so always uh, we study these together so steeple sign both are upper respiratory tract infections i don't know why this is happening some issue with uh, the software today yeah so steeple sign is uh, a disease which you see with croup or acute laringo tracheo bronchitis right so croup or acute laringo tracheo bronchitis is a viral disease unlike acute epiglottitis which is a bacterial disease so this is caused by para influenza virus right so here it's a viral cause it's caused by para influenza virus can somebody tell me what para influenza virus belongs to which uh, group of viruses which uh, what is the family of these viruses p4 paramyxo right so remember this also uh, belongs to the paramyxo virus with measles mumps rsv all of these are paramyxo viruses all right not uh, yeah okay so this is steeple sign what is steeple sign you can see how this airway is basically tapering like this right so like the church ka steeple this is your steeple sign okay one more chest infection because we are studying infections but this is very important because now this is going to be seen in immuno compromised patients yeah so this is going to be seen in immuno compromised patients patients who have neutropenia so the typical history they'll give you here is feeble neutropenia yeah so febrile neutro <laughs> so when they give you febrile neutropenia yeah you want to consider this infection here so what we can see on the high resolution ct on the hrct here is really i don't know what's going on today there's some issue with either obs or some issue with youtube or some issue with me i don't know what's the issue but i mean let's see how it goes otherwise we can continue tomorrow yeah so on the high resolution ct what we are seeing here is there are multifocal such nodules and we are seeing that there is this halo sign right so we are have this central solid nodule and the periphery is like a ground glass yeah so can you see how the center is solid and the periphery is ground glass so this is basically a halo sign and this is because of the angio invasion any time the fungus actually invades into the blood vessels you will have this hemorrhage around the nodule right so that hemorrhage basically presents as this ground glass opacity so you have a solid center and then the periphery is ground glass which is because of the invasion so remember the halo sign is associated with what so this is invasive aspergillosis yeah so we are talking about invasive aspergillosis or uh, invasive angio invasive fungal infection yeah so this is about that all right so halo sign invasive aspergillosis uh, remember this apart from this covid 19 is also something which can have a halo sign so you can remember halo sign is also seen in covid 19 any time somebody asks you can you see this in covid 19 usually your answer should be yes because it has a, a variety of manifestation right so it can produce a lot of these changes like halo sign reverse halo sign however uh, remember <laughs> however remember that uh, covid 19 will not have any of the changes that you are seeing with uh, tuberculosis yeah so whatever we studied for tb free in bud um, necrotic lymph nodes for that matter pleural effusion fibrosis fibrosis can be there in covid 19 but cavitation all of these changes are not associated with uh, covid 19 so except for maybe fibrosis every other change of tuberculosis does not overlap with covid 
okay gjo means ground glass opacity yeah something you must have heard during the pandemic right some point of time you should have heard okay so this is covid 19 invasive aspergillosis going on to the next one uh, what do we have we have a distal uh, radiograph of the wrist and what you can see here is if i tell you that this is a child um, uh, what will your diagnosis be so this is rickets yeah very very important very easy question so this is rickets here and what you have to look out for as uh, the metaphyses yeah so these are the metaphyses of the distal radius and the ulna and you can see how the metaphyses is one irregular second it is cup shaped yeah and it is very much widened so we tend to use these three words here one it is cupping yeah there's cupping of metaphyses the metaphyses is splayed widened and metaphyses is showing frame which means irregularity so all of these changes are happening at the metaphyses in rickets the pathophysiology being that vitamin d here is deficient so when vitamin d is not there you will have hypocalcemia so basically you have all of these cells which are trying to become the bone here at the growth plate but you don't have any calcium so what is that zone which is going to be deficient so the zone is zone of provisional calcification right zpc is going to be deficient here because you have no calcium now all of these cells here osteocytes are all waiting for calcification and they are basically compressing on the metaphysis making it widened making it irregular yeah so if somebody will ask you what is the earliest change in rickets you have to look out for two options one zone of provisional calcification is not there and the second point being that the growth plate will appear widened isn't it because again the bone is not forming you have these cells which are all accumulating isn't it so we have either of these two things yeah correct as sajil that was one uh, example that I'd given in very old class yeah I, i'm glad you remember so zone of provisional calcification deficiency and growth plate widening is what you will see and yes correct we'll be seeing these hypertrophied chondrocytes here which are all waiting for the calcium and they are all accumulating at the growth plate okay so these are the earliest changes apart from that can you tell me some other things that you will see in rickets if the postochondral junctions proliferate what do we call them we call them rosary yeah so we'll see rock rachitic rosary here however remember unlike scurvy these are gonna be rounded these are gonna be non tender so scurvy can also show you rosary scurvy also like rickets will show you that the bone density is low so both of them rickets scurvy both of them show rosary both of them show reduced bone density both of them show reduced cortical thickness yeah so cortical thinning or cortical thickness reduction is seen in both of them right so these are the similarities between both of them now what is the difference before going into the difference remember when i start treatment of these patients when i'm going to start the patient on vitamin d what is going to be the sign of healing rickets agar puchhte ki healing rickets mein kya milega so now do you agree ye suddenly all of these cells waiting for calcium now are all going to get calcium so we'll have a lot of bone getting formed so suddenly you will see that the metaphyses becomes sclerotic it becomes white so that is called as white metaphyseal line we do not use frankel's name here remember frankel ka naam hum scurvy mein lete hain so here we just call it a white metaphyseal line okay so this is the earliest change that we see upon healing rickets if they ask you overall what is the first change that you will see once the healing starts it's going to be a rise in alkaline phosphatase right so because the bone turnover now starts alp will start to increase as the earliest change followed by the x ray change which is earliest white metaphyseal line theek okay? hai so on the same lines let's then study scurvy also so we've already seen the similarities right the similarities between rickets and scurvy what are the similarities dono mein hi bone density is going to be low both of them are going to have cortical thickness which is reduced both of them are going to have rosary yahan pe tender pointy rosary is what we are going to find so now scurvy as we know is because of vitamin c deficiency right so why is vitamin c deficiency leading to reduced bone density what has vitamin c got to do with bone yeah the vitamin c you know helps in what step of biochemistry it's a catalyst for which step or cofactor for which step it's a cofactor for hydroxylation of lysine and proline 
and we know hydroxylysine hydroxyproline are going to help in the collagen synthesis so when vitamin c is not there collagen is going to be reduced any time collagen is not there the osteoid matrix which i need for the bone yeah so any bone has two parts we have osteoid matrix and we have the minerals vitamin d mein minerals mein problem tha here the osteoid matrix is going to be a problem right so that is why again end product is the same that the bone density is reduced can you see how black the bones are uh, seen can you see how the cortex is thinned out so that's going to be similar but the other differences are going to be all in the form of named signs yeah so the named signs that we are going to be seeing as far as uh, scurvy goes is first we're going to have this white line that you were saying and can you see how now here unlike rickets it is white and it is smooth yeah so on an image how to distinguish all of these names are good for theory but in practice in exam if you get a x ray what are you going to see so in the exam the clincher is going to be look at the regularity of the metaphyses if it is irregular it is rickets if it is smooth and you see it is white it is curvy all right so don't just look at the whiteness but look at how smooth it is agar smooth metaphyses mil raha hai non cupped metaphyses mil raha it's curvy if you find irregularity that is going to be rickets okay thank you so much p i also enjoyed taking biostats yesterday i also had a lot of fun okay. so here this is what is called as the white line of frankel yeah so this is the white line of frankel that we were talking about apart from that just below the white line you have this radio lucent zone which is referred to as the trummer field zone now all of these names no need to memorize them very rarely do they ask them even if they ask they'll give you in the options and you might have to you know uh, pick up the odd one out so don't really go on memorizing these names okay ha yahan pe smooth hai ashwati yes and wahan pe irregular hai jaise humne dekha okay so white line of frankel trauma field zone these pointy edges are referred to as pelican spurs and the last change you will look at the epiphyses which is very well delineated iska margin bahut acche se dikhega which is called as wimberger ring sign yeah so four names you want to remember trauma field zone white line of frankel pelican spur wimberger ring sign theek hai to ye char naam hai apart from that can you have sub periosteal hemorrhage here yeah so in scurvy we, we can because we do not have good collagen we will not have uh, we'll have a lot of bleeding yeah so you will have history like history of bleeding gums you will have history of bleeding around the follicle so that results in perifollicular bleeding and that appearance is called as corkscrew hair right so that is called as corkscrew hair and here also in the bone also we can have sub periosteal hemorrhage so below the periosteum we'll have bleeding and that is very very painful so clinically we will have that that this baby bichara is not moving only because of the pain so that is called as pseudo paralysis yeah so that is called as pseudo paralysis so this in a nutshell are all the features of scurvy remember scorbutic rosary is going to be pointy and it's going to be painful peep pointy and painful okay so this is how you distinguish rickets versus scurvy okay yes vasculitis class was also good hopefully that is what you are trying to say what is this distal end of esophagus barium swallow unlike achalasia which had a very smooth tapering now we are having this irregular tapering right can you see how irregular it is and there are all of these out pouchings and there is this shouldering so isko hum bolte anything we don't like we call it as a rat yeah so this is rat <coughs> tail sign the rat tail sign is seen with carcinoma yeah so whenever you see such an irregular appearance on a barium polyp this is suggestive of ca esophagus right so few questions about carcinoma esophagus first of all the history would be obviously dysphagia which is more for solids because it's a mechanical obstruction would have an old person who has uh, you know weight loss and cannot eat so that is the clinical aspect of things when they ask you what is the investigation of choice for ca esophagus so we want to see it with a scope right so investigation of choice is going to be upper gi endoscopy and you can also do a biopsy and confirm that it is indeed a mass and what kind of a histopath you are getting correct so this is about investigation of choice staging ki baat karte hain so again you get a question that what is the investigation of choice for t stage and n stage of esophagus then that is 
EUS, right? So that is going to be EUS wherein you are going to be doing an endoscopic ultrasound. So with your endoscope, you're going to be putting an ultrasound probe and EUS is uh, going to show you the malignancy, the layers that it is involving. So it's very good for T stage. It's also very good for end stage. So it can show you the nearby metastatic lymph nodes also. But when asked investigation of choice for end staging, like anywhere in the body for metastatic workup, it's going to be a PET CT. All right. So if PET CT is not in the option, go for a normal CT. But otherwise, PET CT is going to be your investigation of choice for a metastatic workup for any malignancy. This is true. Okay. So these are the potential questions that can be asked from carcinoma esophagus. Okay. Now I'm showing you barium meal follow through. So before we go into this finding, which I'm sure all of you know, let's have a look at the bubble loops here. Can you see this bubble loop here, which is very, very feathery looking bubble loop? This is your jejunum loop, right? So this is how we recognize our jejunum as feathery because of its valvular coniventus, right? It has these so many complete mucosal folds and it looks very, very feathery, isn't it? And this loop here, which has no feather, which has no hostra, which has no feature only, its feature is it's featureless, is our ileum loop. Hai na? So this is basically your terminal ileum when it was supposed to go into the cecum. Yeah, so this is your ileocecal junction here and you can see how the terminal ileum is extremely narrow, isn't it? So this is not apple core, guys. This is a very, very thinned out terminal ileum. So this is a very long segment terminal ileum structure, which is called as the string sign. Yeah, so this is called as the string sign, which is a terminal ileal structure. Now, this can be seen with tuberculosis as well. Yeah, so TB can show you a distal ileal structure. This can be seen with Crohn's disease also. So remember, for Crohn's disease, the most common site is indeed ileum, the terminal ileum, which is this site. For TB, the most common site is going to be the IC junction. Yeah, so most common site is going to be IC junction for tuberculosis. So here, whenever we are dealing with a case of TB, we will have some sort of uh, you know, changes with IC junction also. When IC junction gets pulled up or, you know, there is some tapering of the junction. When you do not see any such finding, this is more likely to be Crohn's disease, right? So that is how we appear string. This is not pulled up cecum. This is the pelvic inlet, no? So this is where we ex expect the cecum to be. Yeah, so right iliac fossa here, you can see this is the hip joint, right? So this is normal only. Yeah, in case it goes up, then we call it a pulled up cecum, correct? So this is a Crohn's disease. And when we talk about Crohn's, this string sign again becomes a name. So this becomes a string sign of Cantor. Just like how we had white line of Frankel with only scurvy, string sign of Cantor. Cantor ne bola ki main to khali Crohn's mein aunga. All right, so that is why string sign of Cantor is only for Crohn's disease. Okay, got it everybody. So this is how we distinguish clinically how we do it. I mean, in real life, how we do it. So this is more for exams. We never really do barium meal follow through for, uh, you know, real life diagnosis of TB versus Crohn's anymore. Uh, in real life, what we are going to be doing is a CT enterography, right? So remember, investigation of choice for both of these conditions in real life is going to be what? It's going to be a CT enterography. In CT enterography, In CT, am I back? In CT enterography, we will have, I think, I don't know what, what's going on today. Uh, I can't explain it. So CT enterography, what's going to happen is, um, we're going to have a structure of the terminal ileum and along with that, we will also see the presence of nodes, right? So do you remember how we were seeing these necrotic lymph nodes in the chest for tuberculosis? Same thing I'm also going to be seeing in uh, the mesenteric lymph nodes in TB, right? So if you see necrotic mesenteric lymph nodes, then that favors a diagnosis of TB. If you see non-necrotic mesenteric lymph nodes, then wo rahega Crohn's disease. ठीक है? चलो, तो वो है. Thank you. Thank you uh, कि आप लोग adjust कर पा रहे हो. Uh, spiral CT will detect it. Yeah, yeah. Spiral CT is just a mode of acquiring, right? So when you take the CT in a spiral mode, that is how we usually take a CT. Yeah, that is a normal CT scan only. It's not like a very special thing. It is what we normally do. All right. So CT enterography, remember, is the investigation of choice. Fine. Why structure in Crohn's disease? Because uh, 
um negi crohn's disease is a stricturing transmural inflammatory disease right you must have read it in bath how it's a transmural inflammation and you're basically going to be having these long segment strictures with skip areas in crohn's right so anytime there is inflammation which is transmural you'll have strictures that is why okay and that is why it's tree sign yes necro necrotic lymph nodes we have already seen no they are these dark lymph nodes with peripheral enhancement just like we saw with uh, mediastinal lymph nodes same appearance you will have here also okay non necrotic lymph nodes will be seen in crohn's right so if you are having non necrotic then you go in the favor of crohn's disease theek hai yeah non necrotic in crohn's understood everybody so yes crohn's disease does have granulomas pathologically but that's not necrotic necrotic right Cassius necrosis is a feature of TB. Although there are granulomas, Crohn's disease does not produce necrosis. Okay, understood? Right. So on that same line, one more inflammatory bowel disease. When you see that the large bowel is involved in a very continuous fashion, this is ulcerative colitis. Yeah. So this is ulcerative colitis that we are seeing here. You will have a continuous involvement. So it starts off with the rectum. Rectum is the most common site to be involved. and then it spreads in a continuous fashion and it involves the mucosa and submucosa that is why because of the ulceration which is limited to the mucosa what is the earliest sign in you see it's going to be the presence of this mucosal granularity right so we're going to be having this mucosal granularity which we are seeing here okay and eventually as the disease spreads the hostrations remember the hostrations which were a feature of large bowel can you see how there are hostrations here they are going to disappear and so this gives rise to a lead pipe colon a ahostral colon which is lead pipe colon is what we are going to be seeing yeah i don't think it is still stuck is it still stuck no na okay so this is about that what are the various complications of ibd in general one you can have carcinoma second you can have obstruction whenever there is obstruction we call it a toxic mega colon yeah so can you see how here in this x ray you can see this very dilated large bowel loop without any hostration which is more than 6 cm this has to be more than 6 cm for us to call any large bowel obstructed right so this is toxic mega colon and why we call it toxic mega colon is because it has a very high risk of perforation right because this is already inflamed ye perforate ho jayega so never do a barium study never do a colonoscopy here okay this will require urgent exploration because of the very high risk of perforation in this carcinoma if i ask you zyada risk kis mein hai carcinoma again higher risk is with uc as compared to crohn's disease right so remember about that all right so this is as far as ulcerative colitis goes okay what is this we are seeing that there is a barium enema can we do water contrast water is not water is not going to give you contrast right water will have the same density so no point of putting water okay right so this is where you are doing a barium enema and what we can see is that there are these out pouchings yeah so there are these out pouchings which are arising from the sigmoid colon yeah we can see that this gives rise to an appearance which is called as a saw tooth sign so on the barium enema when you see this saw tooth sign this is diverticulosis remember this is a uncomplicated multifocal diverticulae which are false diverticulae arising from the sigmoid colon how does this typically present this presents as lower gi bleed yeah so this presents as lower gi bleed and you won't have any sort of fever pain inflammatory symptoms what is the investigation of choice for diverticulitis diverticulosis you have two options yeah so we have two options here i'll talk about that too okay just give me some time okay so diverticulosis we have two options for investigation of choice one is going to be colonoscopy the other one is barium enema right so go in the favor of colonoscopy more than barium enema if both are options if barium is a choice that is your answer okay so this is about diverticulosis now what is the complication of diverticulosis when it gets inflamed right so that is when i use the term itis isn't it that's what we have studied anything which is inflamed we call as itis so this is 
diverticulitis when the diverticuli get inflamed so now tell me to diagnose this inflammation can i do a colonoscopy or a barium enema when an, when a diverticula is inflamed first of all how will you know that it is inflamed suddenly you will start to have inflammatory features so you will have pain which is left lower quadrant pain you will have fever you will have mucositosis so now in such a presentation when you are suspecting diverticulitis should you put in a scope you know these tiny diverticuli with perforate if you put in a scope should i put barium no again this diverticuli will perf if if it perforates barium will leak out will cause further peritonitis so we know any time perforation is suspected barium is contraindicated so the beauty is jo in iske investigation of choice the dono become contraindication when this diverticula becomes inflamed when it is diverticulitis so how do we diagnose this non invasive cect that you are seeing in the image right so investigation of choice becomes cect right so what you can see here on the ct in the left quadrant is that there are these diverticuli can you see these tiny tiny black black colored lesions yeah and you can see how there is this haziness around it right so you are seeing that there is this haziness around it which indicates inflammation so remember when the mesenteric black fat becomes very hazy it is called as inflammation yeah it is called as diverticulitis all right understood everybody so this is about contrast enhanced ct and how do you pick up diverticulitis do you think we can do mri ever in any emergency no right so remember uh, more often than not any time you are dealing with an emergency mri will almost never be your answer okay so you have to go on with a cct okay got it yeah so this is about diverticulitis and remember both of these investigations are going to be contraindication for diverticulitis okay fibrosis appears hazy um no not really i mean it will depend on where you are seeing so usually we'll see lung fibrosis right anywhere else i mean the fibrosis is not really very apparent so lung fibrosis will appear as these linear bands okay in the chest all right everybody is this topic clear so ct diverticulitis remember i'm going to be seeing that there are all of can you see these tiny tiny black black outpouching these are your diverticula yahan pe bhi ek diverticula tha which is now showing you this thickened wall and you can can you see how there is this white white enhancement my pen itself is so thick yeah can you see how there is this white white enhancement here yeah so this is the diverticula which is inflamed and around it it has all of this fat stranding which indicates inflammation okay i don't think they'll ask you to diagnose diverticulitis uh, though on the image but you need to know that the investigation of choice is cct what is the clinical classification for this guys it is called as the hinchy classification right so we use the hinchy classification for a diagnosis of acute diverticulitis basically it has four stages so stage 1 and stage 2 is when it has not yet perforated stage 3 stage 4 are when it already causes perforation peritonitis okay so broadly you just need to know about the classification fine so this is what it is right what do you see here in this image image number 54 So this is an ultrasound here, and you can see how this is the gall bladder, and you can see that there is a white stone with this posterior shadowing. All right, so this is an uncomplicated gall stone or a polylithiasis, right? So we call this polylithiasis or gall stone, and here basically you're going to be seeing that there's a hyperechoic dependent stone with a posterior acoustic shadowing. Fine, so this is a GB stone, and What are the various complications of a GB stone? One, it can obstruct and produce cholecystitis. Sometimes it can obstruct on the CBD. What do you call this when you have a gallbladder stone only, but it blocks the CBD? While being in the GB, it blocks the CBD and causes jaundice. What do you call that syndrome? That is called as the Merizzi syndrome. Yeah. Apart from that, sometimes these stones can drop down and form CBD stones also and cause obstructive jaundice. But Mary's is different where they are not dropped down. But वो CBD को वहीं से neck से ही obstruct करते हैं and that is called Mary's syndrome. What is the other syndrome? What is the other complication of gallstone that I am showing you here? Good. Whenever you get this black air here and they are telling you that it's pneumobilia, they won't ask you to pick it up. But when they tell you कि pneumobilia है, 
एयर फ्लूड लेवल मीन स्मॉल बावल ऑब्स्ट्रक्शन है वॉट इज द डायग्नोसिस Yes, it is gallstone ileus. So, इसमें क्या हो गया Now there is a fistula between the gallstone and the duodenum which has formed. The stone has gone from gallbladder to duodenum. Duodenum से travel करते करते travel through the small bowel and got stuck at the narrowest part which is near the IC junction. So there it got obstructed and it caused upstream dilatation of the bowel loop. So it caused small bowel obstruction. Yeah, you have a gallstone which is there at the IC junction. and the third part is because of that fistula between gall bladder and duodenum air came into the biliary system which is pneumobilia so what is this triad called that i am describing for you this triad is referred to as the wigglers triad right so the wigglers triad remember will have small bowel obstruction gall stones and pneumobilia okay so this is about the various complication of gallstone so either they can ask you this diagnosis or they can ask you a surgery question ki kya kya ho sakta hai so remember merizi syndrome gallstone ileus polycystitis obviously cbd stones and one more thing if i ask you can the stone also cause gastric outlet obstruction what do we call that syndrome when it causes a gastric outlet or a duodenal obstruction it is called as the bouveret's syndrome yeah so remember bouveret's syndrome is when the stone causes gastric outlet obstruction harusha any time we have obstruction intestinal obstruction we are going to be having air fluid levels right so any time obstruction happens the bowel air and the fluid will stagnate forming these air fluid levels when the person is standing right so in the erect position we have air fluid levels okay that we are hmm. we'll have three more classes three more classes yeah so this about that i think we can stop with the next image which is acute polycystitis so the complication that i was talking about so here you have this stone you have the gall bladder and we can see how there is this thickening of the gall right so when the gall bladder now shows you gall thickness and you have a stone that is impacted at the neck and producing this shadowing this is acute polycystitis because aladi vinay in uh, gallstone ileus we are having small bowel obstruction right stone is traveling to the small bowel and causing obstruction whereas there it is traveling near the duodenum itself and it is causing gastric outlet or duodenal obstruction that is how it's different okay right so this is acute polycystitis the finding would be clinically you are now going to have fever you're going to have right upper quadrant pain you're going to have raised wbc so all inflammatory features and you'll also have a murphy sign wherein when you palpate on the ninth costal cartilage the person will wince in pain a counterpart we can also do with the ultrasound which is called a sonographic murphy sign wherein if i press with the probe at the same point the patient will have pain right pretty simple so acute cholecystitis ultrasound may you will see stones if it is a calculus cholecystitis right apart from that a wall thickness of more than 3 mm is considered to be thickened wall right and apart from that what do you see as the most accurate investigation so acute cholecystitis mein do questions aate hain what is the investigation of choice what do you do in practice it's always ultrasound but if asked what is the most accurate theoretically yesterday we studied accuracy yeah validity accuracy remember so here the most accurate something which is a combination of sensitivity and specificity is accuracy so this is actually the hida scan not something we do in practice for acute cholecystitis but you need to know that it's the most accurate so what will happen this is a normal hida scan yeah where you see gb you see cbd you see small bowel because it's the hida which is traveling into the small bowel via the duodenum in hida in acute cholecystitis you are going to see that now the gall bladder is not visualized because it is inflamed it is obstructed we are going to be having non visualization of the gall bladder yes yeah, so non visualization of gb is what we are going to be seeing okay understood everybody so this is hida scan what is the clinical classification that we use for acute cholecystitis it is the tokyo classification right so tokyo classification remember is also a repeat question that is asked for acute polycystitis fine so i think we can stop at this point today we had a lot of technical issues which were very distracting 
hopefully tomorrow will be better yeah so tomorrow four o'clock again we shall be meeting and thank you for your patience and uh, uh hearing yeah date on my ipad yeah i need to update this yeah it, i don't know why <laughs> my ipad is causing so many problems okay all right guys so i'll see you all tomorrow thank you so much but I also said strep only, na? I why two bands? I'm also saying strep is most common for epiglottitis. That's what I also said. I'll show you also. Let's see, yeah. So we are agreeing the question bank and me. Okay. All right, guys. Thank you so much. See you all tomorrow. Bye.